Hello students. My name is Abhishek Sudhir and I am an assistant professor at the Jindal Global Law School. Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today, we'll be looking at module 10, International and Regional Instruments on the Right to Life, which forms a part of paper on civil and political rights. Various international instruments passed under the ages of the United Nations recognize an individual's right to life. These instruments help in protecting the rights of an individual by providing certain minimum safeguards, which are to be adhered to even if state law or domestic law does not provide for the same. Further, the repeated recognition of the right to life in international instruments can lead one to conclude that the right is now a part of customary international human rights law and must be respected. What that essentially means, that even though a certain state, for example, let us say Sudan or Myanmar, Burma, is not a part of some of these instruments, international instruments, they still must respect the rights contained therein as they now form a part of customary international law. So in this module, we are going to try and achieve two learning outcomes. The first is to give students an overview of the different international and regional instruments, conventions and charters guaranteeing the right to life. The second, hopefully, by the end of the module, students will have an understanding of the international human rights law and instruments on the right to life. Now, coming to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, commonly known as the ICCPR. Let's look at Article 6 of the ICCPR. The ICCPR is the main international treaty on civil and political rights and it's very, very specific about the right to life and the death penalty. Every human being has the inherent right to life, according to the ICCPR. This right shall be protected by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. That is as emphatic as it gets. In countries which have not abolished the death penalty, the sentence of death may be imposed, but only for the most serious crimes in accordance with the law in force at the time of the commission of the crime. What this essentially means is that on January 1st, 2015, if you have committed an act of murder in, say, country X, then you can only be sentenced to the maximum available punishment according to the law in force on January 1st, 2015. So let us assume that you kill an individual on January 1st, 2015. You're convicted by a court of law on February 1st, 2015. It so happens that on January 31st, 2015, that state amends its penal laws and imposes the death penalty for the commission of murder. But on January 1st, 2015, the maximum available punishment for murder was life in prison because the maximum available punishment at the time of the commission of the crime was life in prison, the state can only impose a sentence, the judiciary, the court can only impose a sentence of life in prison and not the death penalty, even though the death penalty was the maximum available punishment on the date of conviction. It's not the date of conviction, but the date of the commission of the crime. The ICCPR also says that the death penalty may be imposed in a manner that is not contrary to the provisions of the present covenant. The death penalty should also be imposed in accordance with the requirements of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. The death penalty can only be carried out according to the ICCPR pursuant to a final judgment rendered by a competent court. Now, this is very important. Two aspects. One, it should be a final judgment which basically means that if you are sentenced to death by a court of sessions, let us say, in India, the court of sessions is essentially the court of first instance. It is the trial court. Then you have the high court, which is the appellate court. And then you have the supreme court, which has this extraordinary criminal appellate jurisdiction, whereby it hears cases of the death penalty. And the ICCPR simply says, that the penalty can only be carried out pursuant to a final judgment rendered by a competent court. Essentially, only if the Supreme Court of India finally disposes of the appeal against the death penalty can that execution be carried out. Essentially, this is why many of you 
will read in the news, for example, that there has been a stay on execution following a judgment of the court of sessions, following a judgment of the trial court. This stay is absolutely necessary because if there is no stay on execution, there is no hold on the execution, then the individual will be executed before a final judgment is granted by a competent court. In India's case, that would be the Supreme Court of India, which is the highest court in the land. Let's continue with the ICCPR and Article 6. When deprivation of life constitutes the crime of genocide, according to the ICCPR, it is understood that nothing in the article shall authorize any state party to the present covenant to derogate in any way from any obligation assumed under the provisions of the convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. What the ICCPR is here trying to say is that the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide takes precedence when the deprivation of life by the state of an individual or a group of individuals constitutes the crime of genocide. ICCPR also states that anyone sentenced to death shall have the right to seek pardon or commutation of the sentence. In India, a person who has been sentenced to death can seek pardon from the president. Amnesty, pardon or commutation of the sentence of death may be granted in all cases. There is absolutely no bar according to the ICCPR on cases in which amnesty, pardon or commutation of the sentence of death may be granted. Essentially, the ICCPR simply states that if a case is fit and the concerned authority believes that the death penalty should not be carried out, there is no bar under the, uh, under the International Covenant on Civil Protocol Rights from granting amnesty or pardon in that case. The ICCPR also says that the sentence of death shall not be imposed for crimes committed by persons between 18 years of age, sorry, below 18 years of age and shall not be carried out on pregnant women. This is extremely important. Recently, in the Nirbhaya case in India, one of the convicts, one of the individuals who raped Nirbhaya was sentenced to only three years in a remand home. This was according to the Juvenile Justice Act in India. The Juvenile Justice Act in India is in cons consonance with the ICCPR because anyone under 18 years of age cannot be convicted of death. Similarly, the ICCPR also protects pregnant women from being executed. Although not sentenced to death, one of Rajiv Gandhi's assassins, Nalini, who gave birth in prison, was on this very ground given a commutation of her sentence. Therefore, the ICCPR is very much a covenant that looks to protect those members of society that it believes should not be executed under any circumstances because of their age or because they are pregnant. Nothing in this article, says the ICCPR, shall be invoked to delay or to prevent the abolition of capital punishment by any state party to the present government. What it basically states is that tomorrow, if a state decides that it wants to abolish the death penalty, there is absolutely no bar in the ICCPR. Article 4 of the ICCPR further asserts that states are not able to derogate from the requirements of Article 6, even in times of a emergency, a national emergency or a public emergency, an experience that we've also gone through in the 1970s. Now let's come to some of the general comments on the right to life. These comments are prepared by the Human Rights Committee. The general comment is a recommendation and it may be adopted by any of the bodies established under various union treaties for the promotion and protection of human rights. These comments, as I've just told you, are prepared by the Human Rights Committee. The right to life was considered by the drafters of the ICCPR to be the most fundamental of all rights. The view, this view rather, was reflected by the Human Rights Committee, which has stated that the right to life is the supreme right from which no derogation is permitted even in time of a national emergency. The committee has further noted that the right to life is basic to all human rights. It is essentially the fountain from which all other human rights emanate from. Now let's look at the arbitrary deprivations of life. The Human Rights Committee 
has emphasized that the protection against arbitrary depri deprivation of life is of paramount importance. For example, the state should not be allowed to put somebody in prison simply because a particular individual does not believe in a certain opinion. Let us say that the state religion is religion A and the person belongs to religion B. Simply stating that the person who follows religion B in a particular state where the state religion is state A, he will be deprived of his liberty. That is arbitrary. There is absolutely no rationality to depriving that person of their liberty. The term arbitrarily is taken to mean not only illegally but also unjustly and includes a requirement to satisfy the conditions of necessity and proportionality. It's very important that these two requirements are met. Let us break down these two requirements. What is the meaning of necessity? Let us say that there is an individual who is a pedophile. Pedophiles are individuals who essentially are who essentially target children. They have they are aroused by children. Now, this some societies may, will consider, or in fact, most societies consider it undesirable. Therefore, there are laws, for example, in the United States known as Megan's Law. Megan's Law is based on the case of Megan who went missing and was abducted. Essentially, what Megan's Law says is that if you move into a particular residence, residential area or a neighborhood in the United States and you have committed an offense that is sexual in nature, your, your name will be entered in a sexual offender's register. Now, the question is, is that necessary and proportional and is it even an is it even a deprivation of life and liberty now when that individual is sent to prison one could say that is it is a necessity because you want to remove that individual from society you want to place him in a prison so that he does not perpetrate any further crimes against children and sending him to prison some might consider is a proportional response but executing him would not be a proportional response also sending him to a mental health institution, for example, is that necessary? You have was something you have to ask yourself, perhaps. But there, subjecting him to treatments that are inhumane is not pro proportional. Therefore, the term arbitrary is wide enough to include not just illegal, but also unjust deprivations of life and liberty. The circumstances allowing for the deprivation of life, therefore, must be clearly established by law and must be capable of being articulated with certainty and subject to due process. Let's go back to the example of the pedophile. There must be a clear law which essentially states that anybody who is convicted of a crime of a sexual nature involving a minor will be subject to such punishment. That must be capable of being articulated with certainty and that punishment must be subject to due process which essentially means that individual must be given a fair speedy and impartial trial depending on the jurisdiction that can be trial by a jury of his or her peers or it can be a trial by a judge much like it is in India which abolished jury trials many decades ago. Moreover there must be substance they must be substantively just and comply with the principles as I've already said of necessity and proportionality. In addition to the obligation not to deprive life arbitrarily, the right to life also imposes a positive obligation to protect life. Till now, we have been essentially dealing with the instances where the state is barred from depriving an individual of his life. Now, we move to situations where the state has a positive obligation to improve and if not just improve, at least very least protect the life of individuals. The drafting history of Article 6 of the ICCPR indicates that a strong emphasis was placed on the duty of state parties, member states that have ratified the treaty to protect life, to take overt positive steps towards protecting life and not just sitting and saying, okay, we won't deprive you of any or life or liberty. But in fact, they must go over and above that and as a welfare state, they must take steps to protect life. The drafters considered that as well as protecting individuals from unwarranted actions by the state, it was also necessary for the state to protect individuals from unwarranted actions by private persons. So the drafters went beyond just the state and they said that it is a duty 
of the state to protect individuals from unwarranted actions and deprivations of life and liberty from other private individuals, fellow citizens, private persons. The Human Rights Committee has confirmed the protection of the right to life requires the states to adopt positive measures. The scope of the positive obligation to protect life will be discussed shortly. The right to life has also been interpreted to impose a duty on the state to investigate deaths occurring in circumstances where the substantive obligations not to take life arbitrarily and to protect life have been or may have been breached. What this brings to mind is custodial deaths. Especially in India, deaths in custody or lockup death as we call it are rampant and although the situation is far better and has now improved, the Human Rights Committee continues to insist that where there is a, a, where a death takes place under suspicious circumstances, where a death takes place when that individual is under the custody or care of the court, then there is a duty on the state to investigate such deaths. The Indian Penal Laws, the Indian Penal Court and the, Crim, uh, the Code of Criminal Procedure are completely in consonance with the requirements of the general comments of the Human Rights Committee and most of these instances of lockup deaths are investigated. Of course, the speed of the investigation leaves much to be desired, but at least on paper, India meets these requirements. Now, given its fundamental nature, the Human Rights Committee has stated that the right to life should not be interpreted narrowly, noting that the right cannot be properly understood in a restrictive manner. Here, the matter of interpretation, as always in any democracy, falls to the courts, the judiciary. Thus, for example, the committee has said that when a, a domestic court or even the state is interpreting the right to life, it should include within its ambit issues such as homelessness, infant mortality and life expectancy as falling within its scope. So essentially, the right to life doesn't mean the right to a mere animal existence. The right to life just does not mean the right to live. It means the right to a livelihood, a right to a good and a right to an adequate standard of life. The general comment also specifies that it would be desirable for state parties to take all possible measures to reduce infant mortality and to increase life expectancy, especially in adopting measures to eliminate malnutrition and epidemics, still a problem in 21st century India. A similarly broad interpretation has been given by some national courts. Let's look at our very own courts. The Indian courts have found that the right to life extends to a right to a livelihood, a right to the basic necessities of life such as adequate nutrition, clothing, reading facilities even, and the right to shelter and education. However, some other less activist national courts have displayed a more cautious approach particularly where there are social policy and budgetary implications, something that is often lost on our very own Supreme Court. Now, let's come to the International Criminal Court or the ICC. The governing legislative instrument for the International Criminal Court is the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Under the Rome Statute, killing of persons either by direct murder or by inflicting conditions which bring about their death, example, depriving them of food, of water, adequate medical care, can come under the jurisdiction of the criminal court if they amount to 1. Genocide, which means such acts committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. The ICC is frequently in the news. Currently, they are trying cases relating to Rwanda, Sudan and in the past have tried cases relating to the former Yugoslavia the former Yugoslav Republic and to Myanmar, Cambodia. Crimes against humanity, if such acts are committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack, also comes under the ICC. Let me repeat, crimes against humanity, provided these crimes are committed as part of a systematic campaign against civilian population. War crimes also come under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court provided they constitute grave breaches of the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention, as you might be aware, is the convention that governs the treatment of prisoners of war, enemy combatants. Acts against persons or property that are protected against the provisions of the relevant Geneva Convention also come under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. 
The International Criminal Court is the single most important enforcement mechanism or body that upholds the right to life. Essentially, the International Criminal Court offers a sanction against erring states that violate principles of human rights enshrined in the various international instruments. Unfortunately, several states still do not recognize the International Criminal Court. Most significantly, in fact, the statute of the ICC states that the death penalty is excluded from punishments the court is permitted to impose. Now, this is quite strange because the court has jurisdiction of some of the most serious crimes in human history. It has jurisdiction, uh, some of the most grave crimes that can be committed on humanity. It has the jurisdiction on mass killings. For example, the Rwandan genocide. For example, the atrocities com committed by uh, the leader of Sudan. The atrocities com com committed by Slobodan Milosevic in the former Yugoslav Republic. Where generally, the cases that they are dealing with are mass killings. Deprivation of human life on a mass scale, on a large scale ethnic cleansing and yet the Rome statute prevents the ICC from imposing the death penalty. This once again highlights the commitment to the right to life that the international community has espoused in the Rome statute. Now let's quickly look through some of the various UN treaties and protocols that have a nexus with the right to life. United Nations treaties and protocols relating to specific categories of persons is what we're dealing with here. The Geneva Convention, as I've already mentioned, which governs the laws of war, upholds the right to life of citizens and civilians, ra civilians rather, and certain types of combatants, those who are injured or have laid down their arms at times of war. So let us assume that there is a war taking place between India and it's one of its neighbors. If a combatant from the neighboring countries comes at a Indian a soldier of the Indian army, with all guns blazing, then that soldier of the Indian army has every right to retaliate and if need be, kill that enemy combatant. However, if the enemy combatant waves the metaphorical white flag, the enemy combatant surrenders, then the Indian soldier has a duty not to kill him and must take him under his control, uh, under his custody and must offer him food, water and medical care as is reasonably expected of somebody in such a situation. So essentially, this is the what the Geneva Convention basically states and therefore it again upholds the sanctity of the right to life that when, when one person who has previously been a belligerent individual who has been attacking you now surrenders, you have a duty to care for him or her. Article 33 of the Convention relating to the status of refugees is relevant. That's the convention relating to the status of refugees. It prohibits the forced return, the principle on non-refuelment of persons facing a threat to their lives in their home country. It is in fact under this convention that many, in, many member states offer asylum. Let us take the example of one of our neighboring countries, Sri Lanka. You will find that there is a huge Sri Lankan population in places such as the United Kingdom. This is because individuals from Sri Lanka towards the late 80s when the civil war had erupted in full force in that nation sought refuge in London because there was a threat to their life from either they believe from the Sri Lankan state itself or the LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Nadu. So the convention relating to the status of refugees essentially prevents signatories to the convention from resending, from deporting, if you will, individuals to states that still have the death penalty and have where they are facing a threat to their lives. The International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination is the most comprehensive treaty concerned with the rights of racial and ethnic minorities. This convention, this convention, uh, protects the right to life of racial and ethnic minorities. Violations concerning the right to life and in particular the discriminatory and disproportionate use of the death penalty as far as ethnic and racial minorities are concerned have been raised with the committee on the elimination of racial discrimination. This committee oversees the implementation of the convention. Another important convention is the Convention of the Rights of the Child which essentially prohibits the use of death penalty for juveniles, for persons under 18 at the, who were under 18 rather, at the time they committed the offence. 
In addition, a number of other articles are concerned with ensuring the right of survival through the provision of food, water, healthcare, etc. necessary for life to children. So it not only deals with the death penalty, but goes beyond that and deals with issues such as nutrition and care of children, who are essentially the most vulnerable members of society. The second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the second optional protocol to the ICCPR, aims at the abolition of the death penalty, urges states to take all necessary measures to abolish the death penalty and stipulates that no reservation is allowed except for the application of the death penalty for most serious crimes of a military nature committed during wartime. So therefore, this optional protocol aiming at the abolition of the death penalty, which came into force in 1989, that certain that countries have the option of signing essentially states that for crimes like treason, perhaps the death penalty can be retained, but for no other crime. In India, we still, of course, as you might be aware, have the death penalty, but we rarely execute people. We have undergone, undertaken approximately three executions in the last 20 years or so. Now, in the sorry, in the last 10 years or so, we now come to the safeguards guaranteeing protection of the rights of those facing the death penalty this these safeguards elaborates elaborate further on the circumstances under which the death penalty can be imposed and the procedure to be followed the Syracuse principles developed by the UN subcommission on the prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities in 1984 asserts that no state party shall even in a time of an emergency threatening the very life of the nation, derogate from a number of key guarantees. One of these guarantees, again, is the right to life and the protection of the debt from being deprived of your right to life. Now let's come to some of the regional instruments. So far, we've looked at the international instruments and the United Nations treaties and protocols. Now the regional instruments. The first instrument we'll look at is probably the most significant regional instrument on human rights, the European Convention on Human Rights. The European Convention on Human Rights protects the right to life and stipulates the circumstances under which deprivation of life shall not be regarded as contravening this article, the article concerned on the right to life. Now, what are the circumstances under which the right to life can be derogated? There, there can be a derogation from the right to life. One of those circumstances is the defense of any person from unlawful violence. Essentially, the right to life may be derogated from in situations of where an individual comes to the aid of another, what we call the right to a private defense in India or self-defense as it's more commonly known. Secondly, in order to effect a lawful arrest or prevent the escape of a person lawfully detained, the European Convention on Human Rights allows the use of force which is no more than absolutely necessary and this may result in a deprivation of liberty. Remember, the force must be reasonable. The European Convention on Human Rights also allows for action lawfully taken for the purpose of quelling a riot or insurrection. Therefore, there are certain situations where the, a derogation from this strict uh, adherence to right to life is permissible. The European Convention on Human Rights does not allow derogation, however, from this principle again in times of emergency except for deaths resulting from lawful acts of war. Now let's come to the American Convention on Human Rights, another regional instrument that recognizes the right to life. The established in 1959, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is the principal organ of the Organization of American States, much like the African Union or the European Union, the OAS or the Organization of American States, which is charged with the, which promoting observance and protection of human rights. The, uh, the commission essentially acts as a consultative organ of the OAS in human rights matters. One of the commission's functions is to receive and take action on petitions and other communications lodged by any person or group of persons. Essentially what the commission does is it offers a forum to individuals aggrieved by the actions of one of the member states to the uh, American Convention on Human Rights and you can approach this commission and they will redress any grievances you might have with regard to any deprivation of right to, of your right to life and liberty. The American Convention on Human Rights protects the right to life and restricts the situations in which the death penalty can be used. Countries that have not abolished the death penalty are allowed to impose it only for the most serious crimes and of course pursuant to final judgment rendered by a competent court. We've been through this earlier in the module. 
the application, says the convention, of such punishment shall not be extended to crimes to which it does not presently apply. Again, the maximum punishment can only be imposed at, as, or in accordance with the law in force at the time of the commission of the crime. The convention also stipulates that the death penalty shall not be re-established in states that have abolished it. It shall not be administered for political offences. For example, corruption uh, related political offences for corruption relating to a particular say ministerial department. Nor shall it be imposed on persons who at the time were under 18 or over 70. And it shall not be applied to pregnant women. Again, the death penalty under no circumstances can be carried out against these vulnerable members of society. There is also a protocol to this convention, the American Convention on Human Rights, and the protocol is known as the protocol to abolish the death penalty. Any nation that is a party to this uh, American Convention on Human Rights may sign the protocol. Those states that sign the protocol agree to eliminate the death penalty. However, it gives them a bit of an out. It basically says that they may declare upon signing their intent to retain it for wartime crimes, basically serious military crimes in keeping with international law. The state is, of course, obliged to inform the Organization of American States' Secretary General of its national legislation regarding the use of the death penalty during times of war. Now let's quickly come to some of the municipal human rights legislations, human rights legislations in individual countries. Another landmark, another landmark act is the Human Rights Act 1998 passed in the United Kingdom. As some of you might be aware, the United Kingdom has an unwritten constitution and therefore has no enumeration of human rights. However, all of that changed in the Human Rights Act 1998 and one of the most important articles is Article 2 the right to life. The article simply states that everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. No one shall be deprived of his life intentionally save in the execution of a sentence of court following his conviction of a crime for which this penalty is provided by law. It is worth mentioning at this stage that the United Kingdom has abolished the death penalty, one of the requirements of membership of the European Union. Deprivation of life says the Convention, says the uh, Human Rights Act, shall not be regarded as inflicted in contravention of this article when it results from the use of force which is no more than absolutely necessary. Here, Article 2 simply replicates the provisions of the European Convention of Human Rights and states that deprivation of life which is no, which from resulting from the use of force which is no more than absolutely necessary is permissible. Now quickly, let's look at the Human Rights Act 2004 passed by the Australian Capital Territory. Australia is a federation and each of the states may pass their own legislation, which is what the Australian Capital Territory did. Section 9 of the Human Rights Act 2004 simply states that everyone has the right to life and no one may be arbitrarily deprived of life. And interestingly enough, the section applies to a person from the time of birth. Finally, let's look at the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Section 7 of the Canadian Charter says, everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So students, we have come to the end of this module. The right to life, as we can see, gets pride of place in the pantheon of fundamental human rights. We have seen how the right to life is almost near absolute and can only be violated or rather derogated in certain ex ex express circumstances. We have also seen how it has been recognized, albeit with certain limitations, through international instruments and regional instruments across continents and cultures. We have also paid specific attention to the death penalty and how many conventions have been ex encouraging its abolition. It is beyond all doubt that the right to life forms the very linchpin of a vibrant democratic society.